Are you ready for the word today? Yeah. Well, you know, last week uh, we got a great kickoff from uh, uh, Mike Keys, and that was really phenomenal. And uh, our series for the summer is Be Salty. Somebody say, Be Salty. Be salty. Turn to your neighbor and say, Be Salty. Be salty. Now, uh, today I'm just going to ask a question. So here's what I'm going to uh, ask you to do. As I start to lay the foundation for the series, uh, uh, I, I need you to just help me out because we've got lots of ground to cover, okay? We've got a lot of places to go to. So would you, would you give me your attention for a few moments? And uh, pay really close attention because as we lay this foundation, this is crucial because if you don't get the first right, you won't get the second right. How many of you know that if you build out of line, if your foundation is wrong, sooner or later your building is going to be crooked? And you're going to end up with a leaning tower of Pisa instead of, you know, the Eiffel Tower. So we want to, we want to build correctly. And so as we start today, uh, for many of us, when we think of the Sermon of the Mount, we think only of the Beatitudes. How many of you know that? Uh, the, when we say, well, Sermon on the Mount, our first thought goes, well, hey, it's the Beatitudes. Now, the Beatitudes is phenomenal. We did a series on the Beatitudes, I think it was last year. And uh, if you did not listen to that, I, I want to encourage you. I know the preacher very well who did it. And uh, I, I would personally say it was pretty phenomenal. And, uh, um, and then also, if you, if you read the devotional with the Beatitudes, it, it, honestly, it's life-changing if you would apply it. Online, they're going crazy. They know exactly what I'm talking about. So, and outside as well. So, but Jesus, when he talks uh, about the Beatitudes, he begins to masterfully explain the concept of what it actually looks like in the following verses. And this this uh, salt and light idea is not a cute idea for this for a summer series. How many of you understand that? It is the very life of those who profess to be followers of Jesus. Jesus starts with the Beatitudes, then like a master communicator, he weaves into the fabric of people's understanding what it actually means to live out the principles of the Beatitudes, and he brilliantly explains the concept of being salt and light. Because right after the Beatitudes, Jesus mentioned this. So if you have your Bible with you, go with me to Matthew 5, and uh, Matthew 5, 13 to 16. These will be our key verses throughout this uh, salty series, okay? And uh, these are very familiar verses. I, I, I would say that if you've been around church, uh, you probably have heard these verses. If you've been a Christian for a while, you probably know these verses. You can probably quote these verses. But I want to get into really the meaning and understanding of them today, so I might not get all the way through would you would you be okay with that so which means you'll have to come back next week again would you be okay with that all righty I'm just checking you okay so listen to what Jesus says so I'm gonna go real slow but I, I'm doing it on purpose to get somewhere uh, Matthew 5 13 you are the salt of the earth who's the salt of the earth we are, we are. you are say I am. I am but what good is salt if it has lost its flavor. Can you make it salty again? Rhetorical question. We know the answer to that, right? N no, not physical salt. It will be thrown out and trampled underfoot as what? Worthless. I want you to remember that word because it's important. And then Jesus goes and says, you are the light of the world, like a city on a hilltop that cannot be hidden. Not that would be hidden, but cannot. It's impossible to hide it because the light is so worth seeing and so needed. No one lights a lamp and then puts it under a basket. Instead, a lamp is placed on a stand where it gives light to everyone in the house. In the same way. Somebody say, in the same way. Now watch this. Let your good deeds shine out for all to see so that everyone will praise your heavenly Father. Now, we don't have time to go into the light part, so uh, for, the, for the first few weeks, we're going to focus on the salt part, because we understand that in the, in the context of what Jesus is communicating in that day and age, uh, salt had a couple of functions. The first function is the function of preserving. It was there to preserve the meat. They didn't have refrigeration. How many of you understand that? 
There was no refrigeration, so salt was used. As a matter of fact, salt was even used uh, in the 13th and 14th and 15th and 16th centuries to preserve bodies before they were buried. And uh, uh, the reason I know that is because my wife told me about that. She watched some show uh, that showed them how they preserve bodies, so that's why I have that great information for you because my wife watches television. So anyway, uh, uh, but it was, it was used to preserve, to preserve meat. But there's another one. It was used to provide flavor. Somebody say flavor. flavor. Now, now, so those are the two, the, the two main reasons for salt. It's there to preserve and it's there to provide. Preserve, provide. Preserve and then provide flavor. Saltiness, and I, I'm going to make a statement to you and I'm going to prove it to you through Scripture because a lot of times we have an idea of saltiness, what it is, because we think of it as an abstract idea of holiness that does not connect to anything. But saltiness is not an abstract idea of you being holy by yourself. I've told you this many times. When I am by myself, I am disgustingly holy. I'm very holy. By myself, I, I, there's nobody around to cause me to stumble. Can I get a weak amen from somebody? When I'm by myself, when I'm with myself, as a matter of fact, me and my dog, when the two of us are together, there's nobody to offend me, and there's nobody that can cause me to sin. I'm just by myself worshiping Jesus and loving on my dog. That's a good day for me. But here's what I want you to understand. Saltiness does not start outside of your relationships. Saltiness starts and is demonstrated within our relationships. How we treat one another will determine how flavorful we are. Now, before you point your finger in judgment towards a brother or sister, I would love you to do something with me today. Would you please, when I preach, not think about someone else? Okay, if there could be, have you, have you seen these TV shows and then they have a, a warning or these, these movies, they have a warning and they would say, well, you know, PG or, you know, PG-13, pure garbage, 13 times over or, you know, whatever. And, and, or they would say MA, you know, mature audience only. Today is for mature audiences only. So what does mature audiences do? They don't focus on the person next to you. So I don't want you to think about your wife while I'm preaching. I don't want you to think about your husband while I'm preaching. And when I say think about it, I don't mean in a kind, good way. That's okay. I'm talking about in an accusatory, ooh, come on, preacher, go there. She needs it. <laughs> you know, I don't want you to, your husband to be black and blue on the side because you are jabbing him as I'm preaching the message. This message, if you really want to catch the flavor of it, applies to you personally. So do not, do not focus on anybody else. Don't focus on someone you know. Don't think about a situation you've had. This is all about you. You and Jesus this morning are going to deal with this so that you can be flavorful and you can be salty because the question I have for you today, how salty are you? I'm going to recommend something to you this morning that you do some introspection and reflection before you do inspection of other people's fruit trees. So we want, we want to start with our own tree before we sit in judgment of someone else's tree. Are you okay with that? That's what this is about. And I'm going to suggest to you that the way for us to keep our saltiness is to preserve something between us in our relationships. When we fight and argue with one another, we lose our ability to influence or give flavor and preservation to the world, and we actually are showing the world that we ourselves don't even allow the Holy Spirit who is the who is the spirit of peace, he's not working in us because we don't even have peace among, amongst ourselves. Wow. Now, there are several references about salt and light, and when we look at the context of it, it's going to make us understand what saltiness really is. So the first place I want you to go with me is in Mark chapter 9. In Mark chapter 9, Mark records in the first several verses about the transfiguration. Anybody heard about that? Yeah. And uh, we, we, we know that Jesus took Pete, Jimmy, and Johnny, and, uh, you know, he took them up to the mount. And then when they were coming down, we know, of course, the glorious things they saw. And then they were coming down from the mountain. And as they were coming down from the mountain, they found a situation. Uh, how many of you ever come from somewhere and found a situation? And, and they found a situation. And the situation that they found was they found the rest of the disciples and the Pharisees in heated argument. 
They were arguing with one another. They were fighting with one another. And the Pharisees and the, uh, were arguing with the disciples, and obviously the disciples are engaging in the same. Now I want you to go to Mark 9, and I want you to listen to what it says, Mark 9, and let's pick it up in verse 16. Are you still with me? Remember, we're going real slow, all right? Now watch this. What is all this arguing about, Jesus asked. Now, stop there and pause for a moment. You understand that when Jesus asks a question, it's not because he doesn't know the information. Right? He is, he is, he is want to reveal something. So he's about to reveal something. So Jesus said, hey, hey, what, what's this fuss about? What, what's this arguing about? Why are you arguing? Then from the crowd, the Pharisees, neither the disciples are answering Jesus. But watch this, verse 17. One of the men in the crowd spoke up and said, Teacher, I brought my son so you could heal him. He is possessed by an evil spirit that won't let him talk. And whenever the spirit seizes him, it throws him violently to the ground. Then he foams at the mouth and grinds his teeth and becomes rigid. It sounds like a two-year-old, doesn't it? So I asked your disciples to cast out the devil, this evil spirit, but they couldn't what? Do it. Do it. Jesus said to them, them who? Them disciples. Jesus said to them, you what? faithless people, how long must I be with you? Or another translation, how long must I put up with you? How many of you know you, you, you're doing something pretty bad when you are frustrating Jesus? Are you with me? I mean, I, I think that's a sign right there. How long must I put up with you? Bring the boy to me. Now, I find this very interesting within the context of an incredible experience like the uh, 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 Mount of Transfiguration where you have Moses and Elijah and you have all these glorious things. And then I find down while they are on the mountain, the glorious things are happening, but below the demonic is taking place. Because there's arguing and fighting. And then, and, and then Jesus is trying to say, hey, hey, is anybody going to come clean on this? Nobody comes clean except the dad that brought his son and say, Lord, I brought my son. And then Jesus makes the statement. The first word he says says, you are faithless. And the reason the disciples could not deliver the boy was because of a lack of faith. But I, I want to bring something out to you. Faith comes how? How does faith come? By hearing and by hearing what? So you have to hear something very specific in order for faith to come in your heart. Now, if faith can come when you hear the word, that means faith comes when you hear the right thing, then that means faith can be diminished by focusing on the wrong thing. Which means that if you don't focus on the word and you focus on your word, what's going to happen, you are not going to have the faith in order to do what needs to be done. Now, if you think I'm pulling this out of my finger, now I want to take a little left turn, we can take a little U-turn, and then we get back on the road. Let's, let's take a U-turn to 1 Peter 3, verse 5, and, and all the way through, and I'm going to show you something, how this whole thing about us not getting along, how it not only affects our faith, but it also affects our prayers. Wow. Are you with me? Yeah. Now watch this, 1 Peter 3 and verse 5. So Peter's writing, and he says this. This is how the holy women of old made themselves beautiful. So how? I, I want to know how the holy women of old made themselves beautiful. We know it was not on the outside, right? Watch this. They did what? Look at the next phrase. They did what? Put their in. So how did they make themselves beautiful? They what? Put their trust in God and accepted the authority of their husbands. Now, for instance, look at verse 6. For instance, Sarah obeyed her husband, Abraham, and called him her master. Woo, I like that. It's a really great verse. Don't you think that's a great verse, man? Come on now, boys. Help me out. The lady's like, well, where are you going with this? Don't worry, girls. Their turn is coming. You're in a moment. And then he says, you are her daughters. Whose daughters? Sarah's daughters, because we are the seed of Abraham. When you do what is What? Right without, listen to this, without fear of what your husbands might do. So what is he saying to the wives? He says, wives, you do what's right whether that turkey acts right or not. He says, you, you, live, you put your trust in God, you do what's right even if he does not behave the way he's supposed to behave. So you give him honor even if it doesn't look like he deserves honor. 
Because giving somebody honor is not about how they behave. Giving somebody honor, it says more about you than about their behavior. Therefore, we can honor somebody we disagree with. And the moment we step into a place of dishonor, we actually reveal that we don't truly believe that God is the God that will actually make a way for us. And he's the one that can reach an, a dishonorable person even if we can't. Uh, are you with me? So you are the daughters when you do what is right without what? Fear of what your husbands might do. Girls, that's a high calling, isn't it? Boys, are you ready for yours? Let's keep on reading because he ain't done yet. Look at the next few words. Help me out. In the the same what way? What, What he just told the girls. The man's not into that, right? In the same way, you husbands must give honor to your Treat your wife with understanding as you live together. She may be weaker than you are. Now, this weaker does not refer to that she's weaker emotionally or anything like that. He's just saying from a natural point of view, usually, not always, uh, uh, but usually, physically, men might be stronger than women. We know that's a natural thing. Right? We know that's a natural thing. So we're not trying to be sexist here or anything like that. He's just saying you need to understand. But watch, he doesn't stop there. He says, she may be weaker than you are, but she is your what? Equal partner in God's gift of new life. So, so it, it, you, you might think you're better than her, but just to remind you, you're not because she's your equal. Then he goes on, and I want you to listen to these words. Treat her as you should. Why? So your prayers will not be hindered. He's saying that you, if you, you want God to bless you and you are praying for an answer, but you can't even get along with one another, you can't even honor one another, and if you can't honor one another, what you are doing, you are literally hitting the void button on the power of God in your life. The thing that will devoid God's power is when we are in conflict with one another and we dishonor one another. Man, I'm preaching good right now. Look at verse 8. We're not done, right? This is the foundation. Finally, all of you should be of what? One mind. Listen to these words. Sympathize with each other. Love each other as brothers and sisters. Be what? tender-hearted, and keep a... But he's not done yet. Verse 9, don't repay... And listen to these words. Don't retaliate with insults when people... Well, I'm going to give you a piece of my mind because you gave me a piece of your mind. Be careful when you give that piece. That might be the last piece you give away. And then you'll be mindless after that. So, And then you say things that you don't want to say. Because you are retaliating kind for kind. If you are salty and you want to be flavorful, don't retaliate with insults when people insult you. Instead, pay them back with a... Are, are, Are we getting nervous? Look at this. He's not done. This is, what is? This paying back an insult with a blessing. This is what God has called you to do, and he will grant you. Do you know that the reason some of your prayers are not being answered is because you're in conflict with your brothers and sisters, and you justify your behavior because you say, well, you don't know what they said to me, or you don't know what they did to me, or you don't know how they behave towards me. But Peter is saying, he said, hey, none of that really matters because even if they insulted you, you do not insult back. What you do is you bless. Why? Because you are more interested in getting from God what you need than getting from people what you need. Because people cannot give you what God can give you. 
And if husbands and wives are not connecting together, then he's saying all your prayers, you can be praying and praying and praying, but the reason there's no answer, because God is saying you salt is worthless because there's no saltiness in it. And your saltiness has got nothing to do with how super spiritual you are or how much you pray in tongues or how much you do any of that. It has to do with how you treat one another. When we argue and fight, just like the disciples, we are more interested in proving a point than in meeting someone else's need. Arguing and fighting is not an environment where miracles happen. Conflict will drain us of the faith that we need to walk in God's power. How do I know this? Because Jesus comes down from the mountain. He, he is full of power. They are in arguments. They needed to heal somebody. They couldn't heal them. They were more interested in answering an argument from the Pharisees than in seeing the need of a young boy that needed to be delivered. When the church is more interested in winning arguments than delivering people, we are losing our saltiness. Are you okay out there? See, because we think we show our superiority by winning an argument, but we actually show our foolishness. You're showing that you don't understand what kingdom you are of. Hello? The baby agrees with me. Do you hear that? Out of the mouth of babes right there. You heard it. So, let me make some salty statements to you, and then I'll, I'll show you because I'm going to weave this in throughout this message, and, and then when it's ready to quit, I'm just going to say quitting time, and we'll pray, and you'll all repent. Because <laughs> while I'm reading this, I'm repenting. Are you with me, somebody? <laughs> to be salty, we must be willing to take last place. You see, we live... We live in an environment in a society where everything is about me winning. All I got to do is win, win, win. I win. No, Jesus said I die. Not win. You see, I would rather win a friend than win an argument. Now, I want you to notice this. Look at Mark 9. We still Mark 9. And I want you to notice the story continues. It doesn't end. Are you still, so we're still in the context, right? Are you with me? We're still in the context. Look at Mark 9, verse 33. After they arrived at Capernaum and settled in a house, Jesus asked his disciples, here's that questioning thing again. Uh, boys, uh, what were you discussing on the road? Look at verse 34. But they didn't answer because they had been arguing about which one of them was the... So for, now watch, what, folks, I need you to understand something. The more you operate in a certain way, the more you're going to operate in it. And you, you, some of you don't even understand how argumentative you are. You see, first they argued with the Pharisees, then they argued with one another. You see, that spirit of conflict is unwilling to let go because it knows that if we can identify it, and if we can say that's an issue, we can bring it down and we can actually open up God's blessing in our lives and we can see things we've never seen. We'll see sick people delivered all because we are willing to forgive one another. He sat down, now watch this, called the twelve disciples over to him and said, whoever wants to be first must take what? Last place and be the what? Servant of everyone else. Then he's going to illustrate it to them. Then he put a little child among them, taking the child in his arms. So look at the picture now. He takes a little child. He puts a child in his arms while he's talking to them. He said to them, anyone who welcomes a little child like this on my behalf welcomes me. And anyone who welcomes me, welcomes not only me, but also my Father who sent me. What Jesus is saying is absolutely profound. 
It is so profound that we know they did not get it. Because Jesus takes a child and he illustrates them. You see, for, for them, especially in a pharisaical mindset, for them, children doesn't understand anything, doesn't know anything. But we know one thing about little children is that they are innocent. They, they, there's no deception in them. They just are who they are. Children will say things we think they shouldn't say. How many of you know children has no filters whatsoever? Children are just what they are, children. Right? They are real. They just the way they are. And yet Jesus takes a little child, and then he says to them, he says, you've got to understand, if you want to be first, you actually must be lost, and you must serve everybody. And then he picks up a child, and he's saying, hey, whoever welcomes the child, what is he saying? Whoever understands the way that I operate must have a childlike faith in me. You must have a childlike faith. Otherwise, what will not happen? You cannot hear from me, you cannot welcome me, and you cannot not receive from me because this is the way my kingdom operates because and here's what happens when you are willing to accept that least position then not only are you welcoming me but you are welcoming the father now let's let's take a breath we are cycling and we are going to a higher level of elevation the oxygen is light are you ready? Because today, we don't necessarily argue about who is the greatest. We argue about not getting our way. You see, we know this, that if we argue about who is the greatest, we will immediately expose ourselves to, uh, to knowing that we are prideful and arrogant. So we hide our pride. We hide our arrogance. You see, if we claim that someone else has treated us with contempt, then we can garner sympathy and build up a claim of being mistreated. All in the name of justifying our responses towards others, even if those responses are not Christ-like. You see, we want everybody to act like Jesus towards us, but when we have to act like Jesus towards them, we claim some form of recompense for being unjustly and unfairly treated. So we're saying, you don't understand, preacher boy, that what they have said or what they have done. So what do we do? We garner sympathy so that people feel sorry for ourselves. Why? Because we still, in the end, want to get our way. And get I tell you what it is to put yourself first. It is always to get your way. Come on, somebody. So what do we do when the Lord says, okay... Because Jesus will expose that. Come on now, somebody. Jesus will expose that. And we get uncomfortable when he exposes it. And so what do we do when we get exposed? We, we do what Adam did. Not only hide, we point fingers. We deflect. Are you with me? You say, well, where are you getting this, preacher boy? Well, I'm not done yet. The quickest way we do that is to deflect to someone else's behavior. Now, if you think I'm pulling this out of my hat, I don't have a hat. Help me read on. And in verse 38, are you still with me? Because we see John, John that was not part of it, but we see very quickly he tries to deflect and justify a behavior towards someone else, claiming he did it to protect and defend the name of Jesus. Watch this. So, so Jesus is taking a little child. Imagine we are still in the part of the same story. Are you with me? This is not another day. This is not another time. They're still in Capernaum. They're still in the house. Jesus called them together. Jesus is holding a little child. He's telling them how they need to be. And, and as he's saying, they're all caught because it's uncomfortable. Why? Because they were all arguing who was the greatest. Now, do not exclude 
Pete, Jim, and Johnny. And why? Because the other disciples were arguing, remember, with the Pharisees, and they were not there. So they were not included in that argument. But guess what? They definitely were included in the argument of who was the greatest. Because I can guarantee you, Peter said, guess what we saw? We can't tell you because we are actually greater than you. So now watch, that spirit is not just happy to infect. Let me say, let me say this to you about conflict and arguing and, and, and messing around with people and, and having this insulting attitude towards one another. It is never satisfied to just corrupt its own heart. It wants to corrupt other people. Because we think the more people we can get on our side so we can prove our argument, the more we show that we are actually right and they are wrong. But God is not interested in who is right and who is wrong. Why? Because He knows who's right and who's wrong. He's right, we are wrong. God is not interested in who's right and who's wrong. He's interested in who is righteous. Look at Mark 9, 38. Are you still there? Is this too much for you? Can you handle this? Look at the verse. Mark 9, 38. John said to Jesus. Now you think, oh, he's going to say, Lord, I'm so sorry, man. We're just not getting it. Please be merciful with us. Look at this. Teacher, we saw someone using your name to cast out demons. Huh? Huh? What does this have to do with what we're talking about? But watch this. But we told him to stop because he wasn't in our group. Someone else is doing what we could not do. And because someone else is doing what we could not do, yet they use your name, we felt the authority to say that they are not from our camp. They're not from our church. They're not from our group. They're not from our denomination. So because they're not from our denomination and they don't believe the way we believe, we had to shut them down. Verse 39. Are, Are you still there? Oh, you're getting mad at me. I can feel you right now. Listen to what Jesus said. Oh, John, thank you for covering us. Thank you for having my back, John. Did he say that? Look at this. Don't stop him, Jesus said. No one. Somebody say no one. Say it again. Who performs a miracle in my name will soon be able to speak evil of me. We have a lot of people that say people are getting healed by the devil. How dumb is that? How can the devil work against his own kingdom? Why would the devil heal people? I I, I don't know if it makes sense to you. That doesn't make sense to me. Come on, somebody. No one who performs a miracle in my name will soon be able to speak evil of me. Anyone who is not what? Against us is... If anyone gives you even a cup of water because you belong to the Messiah, I will tell you the truth. That person will surely be rewarded. Mm. We've got to get this right. Because this has to do with our capacity to walk in God's power to set the people free around us that need to be set free. Because in both these instances, both in them not being able to deliver the young boy, but yet someone else is able to use the name of Jesus and deliver someone else. I just want to let you know, not everybody that's in the in crowd is is the no crowd. Just because you have the title doesn't mean you have the authority. And just because you don't have the authority doesn't mean you have to clamor for it. Don't take pot shots at people. That's just stupid. Listen, listen, I'm going to say this, and you're going to be mad, but I'm going to say it. Don't correct people you do not have a relationship with. Well, let me correct you. Well, do I know you? Have we walked together? Have we prayed together? Have we stood together? Have have we fought together? Have we been together? Listen, uh, correction can only be taken over a relationship bridge. 
If there's no relationship, if there's only, if there's only positions and no relationship, it's very difficult to bring correction. And maybe it's not your place. Not everything, not everything that you see that needed to be corrected is your job to correct. Okay, that's enough. I'm not going down that path because we're going to go a long way. Now, can we, can we back up here and can we go to Luke 14 real quick? I just want to show you I'm not just using one passage. Luke 14 verse 7. Are you still there, church? Okay, I, I'm try, I'm, I'll try to hurry this because I know you, you want to go to the restaurant. So uh, Luke 14 7. But I tell you what, this is better than any steak you can ever have. I guarantee you that. And this will help you in your marriage. This will help you in your relationships. This will help you in every arena of your life. This will help you get your prayer answered. When Jesus noticed, Luke 14, 7, when Jesus noticed that all who had come to the dinner were trying to sit in the seats of honor near the head of the table, he gave them this advice. How many of you would take Jesus' advice? Okay, when you're invited to a wedding feast, don't sit in the seat of honor. Now, for them, the context is a little bit different than ours. But what if someone who is more distinguished than you has also been invited? The host will come and say, give this person your seat. He's going to move you. Then you'll be embarrassed. And you will have to take whatever seat is left at the foot of the table. Instead, somebody say instead. instead. Take the what? Lowest place at the foot of the table. Then when your host sees you, he'll come and say, friend, we have a better place for you. Boy, I like that one. Then you'll be honored in front of all the other for those who what? Exalt who? Themselves will be what? And those who what? Will be? There's a principle of understanding that I'm leaving the exaltation in God's hands, not in mine. I'm not there to exalt myself. I'm not there to put myself on a pedestal. I'm not there for that. I trust God that if it's my time to be promoted, then he will find a way to promote me. And no man and no woman can stand in my way when God decides I have a seat at the table. Because I don't determine the seating arrangements. I'm just happy that I get to be at the table. Is anybody else with me? Because I know people say, well, I deserve this. You know what Henny deserves? I deserve hell. That's what I deserve. But I get heaven and everything else thrown in between. That's what I get. I get to have a relationship with a living God. I get to be in His Word. I have the privilege of looking at your beautiful faces week in and week out and preach the living Word of God to you. That to me is a privilege, not a right. Be careful in how we treat one another when you decide it's time for you to be exalted instead of trusting God to do the exaltation because you will be embarrassed. And not because somebody else did it to you, because you did it to yourself. Because you assume that you deserve a certain thing doesn't mean that God's ready to give it to you. Oh. I'll give you one more thought, and honestly, because otherwise we're going to be here a while. Can I give you one more thought? Yeah. This will be a quick one. So what's the first thought I told you? To be salty. What's the first one I gave you? Help me out. I must be willing to see the needs of others. What's the second one I gave you? I must be willing to take life. See, you already forgot it already. I mean... So we, okay, what's the first one I gave you? Help me out. Okay, to be salty, I must be willing to what? See the needs of others. So therefore, in my relationship, I don't look at what I need, I look at what someone else needs. That's called empathy, that's called compassion, that's called understanding. Right? So before I want to be understood, I must have understanding. All right? Secondly, to be salty, I must be willing to what? Take last place. And that last place is the things that I think I deserve, but, but I need to get away from what I deserve and understand that everything I have is by the grace of God. And then let me give you one more, and then we'll close here, and then we'll pick this up next week. To be salty, I must act radically against anything in me that might cause others to stumble. I'm going to say it again. To be salty... I must act radically against anything in me that might cause others to stumble. 
Now, same context. Somebody say, same context. Same chapter. Jesus, he's still talking about the same thing. He didn't change the topic. Are you with me, somebody? Look at verse 42 of Mark 9. Look at this. Mark 9, 42. But if you cause, so, so Jesus goes to John. John deflects. John points to someone else. Jesus brings him now back. Then he has still the child in his arms. And he says, hey, but if you cause one of these little ones, listen to these words, who what? Trust in me to fall into sin. That means if you turn somebody with faith to a faithless thing, it would be better for you to be thrown into the sea with a large millstone hung around your neck. Would you agree with me that this is radical? Why is this so radical? It's radical because Jesus knows that we'll never get what God wants us to have until we sort it out amongst one another. The two things that the whole gospel is built on is number one is to love God with all your heart, all your mind, all your strength, all your soul. And the second one is equal to the first one. It is to love your neighbor as you love yourself. By this shall all men know that you are my disciples if you love one another. You are the salt of the earth. But if the salt loses its flavor, where's the flavor amongst ourselves? And if we bicker and argue and fight and always validate ourselves... Instead of having understanding and grace and mercy, if we're trying to get always the right, instead of saying, no, I don't care who's right and wrong, I'm going to be righteous. I'm not going to insult back when somebody insults me. Are you with me? Look at this. It's radical. Verse 43. If your hand causes you to sin, that means if you're writing that letter and you're going to give them a piece of your mind, Don't send it. It's better to enter eternal life with only one hand than to go into the unquenchable fires of hell with two hands. If your foot causes you to sin, it's better to enter eternal life with only one foot than to be thrown into hell with two feet. Now listen, we know that Jesus is not recommending that we're chopping off our hands and chopping off our feet. Are you with me? Jesus is painting a picture for them of how radical we must be against these things that causes us not to live in peace with one another. Hello? Verse 47, and if your eye causes you to sin, gouge it out. It's better to be in the kingdom of God with only one eye than to have two eyes and be thrown into hell where the maggot never die and the fire never goes out. For everyone, somebody say everyone, help me out, everyone will be what? Paul writes in Corinthians and says that we as Christians will receive a judgment. It's called the judgment seat of Christ. And he says all of our works will be tested. And what does he say? Tested by what? By fire. He says why? So that that which is substance will remain and that which is not will burn away. You are only going to be left with the fruit of the Spirit, not the fruit of the flesh. And everything that's of the flesh, meaning anything that is birthed from a natural thing to get a natural way, will be consumed and will be gone. Jesus makes the statement, and it is profound, and I don't know if you ever thought about this. He makes the statement, and he says, is anything worth more than a man's soul? He says, what does it help anybody? What does a man gain by by obtaining or gaining the whole world but lose his soul in the process? Is anything worth more than that soul you possess? And obviously, we know the answer to that is what? No. Why? Because the soul is going to continue forever. But everything else, how much is, is it going to matter in the end of all things that you want an argument with somebody? How much is that going to matter that you got your way? 
Hello, somebody. Every one of us, and that's all of us, will be tested by fire. Now, <laughs> can you give me two minutes? Just give me two minutes. Two minutes. If I know that I'm going to be tested by fire, should I not be more afraid of the one that knows everything than the ones that don't know everything? Let me give you an example. If somebody accuses you of the wrong motives, but yet you know your motive is right before God, what does it help you arguing with that individual? Exactly. Trying to defend yourself. Yeah. Listen, the, one of the things that I've learned a long time ago in my life, it, it, the, the, the one thing I will not do, I refuse to do, I'm not going to start now, I haven't done it in over 30 plus years of ministry, I will never defend myself. Amen. Just won't. If I get an email that is specifically directed to me about things about me and how I will never, I will never even, most of the time, I will not even respond except maybe just responding, I'm so sorry you feel that way, but, you know, let's serve the Lord together in His love and mine, PH, Pastor Henny. And if they really mad at me, I'll just write Henny Bosman. So they don't see me as they pass there anyway, so, so I'm not going to pretend. Are you with me? Because if some, listen, if somebody's accusing a motive, what, what, what's, the, what's the one thing you don't see? Is motive. You can't judge somebody's motive. Now, what I can judge though, and we'll get into that a few weeks from now, maybe a few, few weeks from now, but, but one of the things we do do is we do look at fruit. So don't say, well, don't judge. Well, I, I'm looking at fruit. There's a difference, yeah. right? But when I'm looking at the realm, I, I call it the realm without rules. That means the stuff that I don't see, but I assume it is. When I assume you do something from a wrong motive, because not because the action is wrong, but just because I'm mad at you and because now you said something and I'm saying you said that because of. Guess what I just did? I just told you I'm God and I know what you do, why you do it. When I myself don't even know my own motive. So the thing that will test it one day, why am I worried about trying to sort people out? Because in the end, I know that God will sort them out. He will. You see, for us right now, and you might not like this, God is using this loud mouth preacher to try to sort you out now. Why? So that we can get it together now. So that one day when the fire comes, that we will be pure. I can't go any further. But I think we have to make a choice. You have to decide. You have to decide. Do you want people to be set free? Do you want your prayers to be answered? And if you're married, then husbands, treat your wife with love and respect and understanding. Wives, treat your husbands with honor. In all of the church, we ought to honor one another. So anything that's dishonoring, I want to dis. So I don't want to do it. So before I act in a particular way, before I say anything, I will need to ask myself the question, am I being honoring? I am not talking about a situation where somebody comes and asks, say, can you help me with this? So, and not telling them the truth. I'm not here saying that don't tell the truth. Because without truth, people can't live in love. Right? But what I'm saying is, is that before we get accusatory and jump on one another, let's have understanding and grace and mercy. You want, let me just ask you one question. I know what I want. And you know what you want. But let's ask, what does God want? See, we want everybody else to act like Jesus towards us but you ask yourself have you acted like Jesus towards someone else that's the question the question for maturity is not how did they treat me <laughs> the question is 
how do I treat them? How do I treat them? And is there anything in me that could be seen as abrasive, obnoxious, prideful, arrogant? Even if that was not the motive. But could it have the appearance of evil? And if it does, I'm going to ask God to forgive me. So that I can walk in the freedom that he has for me. So that when I pray with my wife and trust him for something, that my prayers will not be hindered. So that when I'm with another religious group, that I'm not going to get stuck into an argument. Hello. That I'm going to just allow the Holy Spirit to give me wisdom to say, my friend, it's okay for us to agree, to disagree about this topic because it really does not affect our salvation. But there's a little boy that needs to be touched. There's somebody that needs to be healed. There's somebody that needs to be loved. And I'm going to focus on loving that person instead of getting caught up arguing with you. That's what I'm going to do. Amen? Amen. Let's be that kind of church. Let's be that kind of church so that God's power can truly move in and among us so we can heal those who need it to be healed. Let's bow our heads this morning. And maybe you're here today and you're one of those that maybe carry some wounds. You're one of those that carry some things and maybe you've never really submitted all of your heart and all of your life. Maybe, maybe you're one of these people that says, well, you know, Henny, that's exactly the reason why I don't serve God. Because of all these bunch of Christians, they're just a bunch of phonies and, and hypocrites. Well, that's all true. We all were phonies, you know, and we all hypocrites, including you. A hypocrite is just sim- simply someone that says something and do something else. And I think if we're all honest in this room, we all have said something and have done the opposite. So that means, welcome to the club. This is the club for hypocrites. Now you can be part of it. The difference is we are hypocrites that have been washed and cleansed by the blood of Jesus. And we now want to live our life for the glory of God. So if you're in this room, if you're online, inside, outside of this building, and you've never professed Christ to be the Lord of your life, meaning you've never embraced Him and said, be my Lord, be my Savior. You've never done that. Then I want to pray with you right now. And I, I, and I want you to know that maybe in some way if the church hurts you, and when I say church, I don't just mean this church, I mean church in general or church people. And maybe because of that, you've, you've walked away from God. And you say, well, you know, I, I, you just don't understand what they've done. I, I want to say that I'm sorry. I'm sorry that the people that were supposed to help you hurt you. But I want you to know that there's grace and forgiveness not only for you, but also for them. And if you're willing today, to confess, if you're willing today to come to God, if you're willing today to say, God, I want to come to you. I want my life to be changed because I want to live the way you want me to live. I don't want to live for myself. I don't want to have a selfish mindset. I I don't want to be the kind of person that only has the idea that it's me and nobody else. No, I want to live for you and I want you to come and change me from the inside out. If that's you, I would love to pray for you. So maybe you followed God at some point, but maybe you walked away from God. Or maybe you prayed some prayer, but you haven't followed through. Or just maybe, maybe you've never, never invited Christ into your life. Then today I'm going to ask you to do that. And if that's you, I want to pray with you right now. Whether you're online, in this room, sitting outside, I would love to pray for you. If that's you and you say, Henny, that's me. Would you pray for me? Would you just go ahead and pop your hand up right now? Just pop it up high and let me see it. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you, 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 thank you. I see that. God bless you. Thank you, thank you. I see that. God bless you. God bless you. Thank you, thank you, thank you. You can put it down. Thank you. I see that. God bless you. God bless you. Thank you. I'm going to lead in a prayer. There's no magic in this prayer. As a matter of fact, I'm, I'm going to do something. I'm going to ask you to stand with me. Would everybody just stand together? And I'm going to lead you in this prayer. There's no magic in this prayer. It's just a way of bringing our hearts before the Lord. Would you pray with me, everybody? Would you pray this out loud online? Would you do this outside? Would you do this? Just pray this. Say, Lord Jesus, I come to you today. I confess that I am a sinner in need of your mercy. I ask you now that you would forgive me, that you'd give me a fresh start from today. 
I want to follow you and no other. From today, I want you to be my Lord, my Savior. I confess with my mouth, I believe in my heart that you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. And I ask now that you would come and live in me. And I thank you that my past is forgiven and forgotten, washed away by the blood of Jesus. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen and amen. If you believe that, give the Lord a clap offering that he is worthy of today.